All right, so today is going to be just a brief introduction to probability, and we're going to discuss SPSS number two, which is due October 14th. Um, there will not be any new homework you have to complete after this video because you need to watch the next video with the harder word problems before I assign anything. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and knock this out um, to discuss the SPSS number two. I do believe I loaded it with the lecture notes for today, but it is also loaded into the SPSS module stuff, um, due October 14th by 1 p.m. So the first part of this, the first, let's see, five steps are based off of what you learned how to do in SPSS number one. So if you've forgotten, say, how to get a box plot or things like that, you may need to pull out SPSS number one. All right, now then starting in step six, this is for linear regression on SPSS. So I start telling you, since this is brand new and you've never done that on SPSS, I start telling you exactly what to do. So you follow those directions very carefully. It is a two page document. And I apologize that it's messy. I only had a PDF copy. And since this is going to be turned in online, I had to kind of cross out the stuff that related to if you were actually printing this. All right, so number nine is still something you're doing on SPSS. Then I tell you to open up a Word document. And again, very similar to last time, I'm not asking you for everything in your output screen. I've listed exactly what I want for you to copy and paste into your Word document. Um, this is also, you're going to type me two sentences of interpretation. So in those two sentences are usually worth 20% of this homework. So make sure you use your lecture notes from linear regression to be able to interpret the slope and the coefficient of determination very precisely for the data set for this homework assignment. Um, and then you're going to upload your Word document to the Canvas assignment sheet. This is the data set right here. I copy and pasted it. It was from a book. You can read about it. It's very real life about the Serengeti National Park. Now, the thing that goes the most wrong, and this sometimes is also on some of my handouts and the book. A lot of students don't understand, <clears throat> excuse me, textbook editing. When we have a data set of 15 data points to give you, if we type everything straight down, it takes up a lot of paper. So a lot of the times textbooks will split it up. Like here's wildebeest percent burn. Here's more wildebeest, more percent burn. Even more wildebeest, more percent burn. This is not six variables. These are two variables. You'll type in all the wildebeest and then all of the percent burnt. Okay, so make sure you use all of the data, but you understand that it's two variables and not six variables. All right, so if you have questions, get started early and I can help you. All right, moving on to introduction to probability. So probability is part of test two, and it's probably the hardest topic we cover in Math 220. And with that said, I have attempted to make it a little bit easier this semester, but it is still very hard. Now, definitely do not read all of the pages in the textbook if you're a textbook person. I only do just a little bit. A lot of colleges, they teach courses in probability, or probability will be half of their statistics course. Here at JMU, Statistics is our main goal of Math 220. We just do a little bit of probability. These focuses are not going to probably make sense until you go through this video and the next, but I'm going to write them up anyway. Thank you. 
So we're going to go through some probability rules pretty quickly in the next video to then be able to apply them to word problems. And that is part of the next video. And that is hard stuff. So that's the first time that you may have to do handout eight, three and four times. I promise you, my past students will tell you, you will get the hang of it. But doing handout eight once or twice is probably not going to do it. You will start to see the patterns and how most of the problems are very, very similar. But at first, it might be a little overwhelming and you just have to put the time into it. But getting into the word problems and the rules is the next video. Then, so that's one focus. Then the other one is much easier. This one is handled in a video after the word problem video. Um, reading off of data charts, super easy. I think the part of the video that takes care of that is like 10 minutes long, um, so not hard at all. And just in general, we're gonna be working with discrete data. Let's pull that word from the past. There's gonna be problems of um, how many cars passed inspection? How many chores did you remember to do today? How many houses have a home security system? That idea that you can't have a third of a house or a half of a car, that type of thing. So we are definitely going to be dealing with discrete data. Let's just put up some general... Thoughts, probability, systematic study of uncertainty, which probably sounds like it's an oxymoron, but it really can be done. For the next few minutes, you're going to hear me continue to talk about long term, long run. And I think this quote helps explain why that's actually a thing. Chance behavior is unpredictable in the short run, in the short term, but has a very predictable pattern in the long run. So everything we're doing is long term. Each book will usually talk about the various types of probability. The first one is probably what most people think of. The classical or theoretical probability. It's good for chance experience, <laughs> experiments. I shouldn't write and talk. Good for chance experiments. Think, coin, flipping coins, rolling dice, go to a casino and spin the roulette wheel, things like that. Now there is something called the law of large numbers. Law of large numbers. As we do the experiment over and over and over, and an experiment can be just flipping a coin or rolling a dice. We're not talking about a chemistry lab. It settles down to what we call the true probability. I put true in quotes because technically, unless we do this infinite times, 
it's still really just an estimate, but he gets so close that we do consider it the true probability. We never have time even when we're in the classroom, but I think everybody is completely convinced the probability of flipping a fair coin and getting heads is 50%, right? But I hope you know that if you flip a coin 10 times, hardly any of you are gonna get exactly five heads. Most of you are gonna get between 30% and 70% heads, but actually there's gonna be a few of you who get zero heads or 10 heads. And that doesn't mean that you have an unfair or magic or trick coin. It just means that the short term, the short run is very unpredictable. Now, if I had you flip a coin 100 times, it's actually an even smaller probability that you get exactly 50 heads, but a much higher percentage of you would get between 40 and 60 heads or 40 to 60%. Um, so the more times you do it, the closer, the tighter the range around 50% is. One of my kids for a seventh grade science fair project basically, make a long story short, flipped a coin seven to 8,000 times. And I did not calculate the probabilities. I tried to go into it like a seventh grader. And I would have thought that she would have gotten closer to 50% than she did. I think she was still at like 49% heads. And that's at 8,000 flips of a coin. So, you know, how big is long run? over and over and over, how many times do we mean? For a coin, that could be a quarter million times to get really close to that 50% mark. And a coin only has two sides. Think about how many times we might have to roll a dice to be able to see that one sixth probability or something. So when we talk about law of large numbers, we're talking about actually really large numbers, really long term. Um, Let's make sure, this is the same thing when we were doing, oops, I forgot the second one. Sorry, guys. This is kind of relating back to test one. So empirical, not the empirical rule. The word empirical means from experience, empirical probability. Cumulation of past results. A lot of people call it the relative frequency approach. And that's the part that is very similar because we've already learned about relative frequencies on test one material. You're basically using the past to predict the future. This is for things that we don't have a coin to flip or a dice to roll, right? I don't know if you were in elementary school, if your teacher had you flip Hershey Kisses or Dixie Cups or something. Like, think about a Hershey Kiss. You know, if I asked you, what is the probability when you flip a Hershey Kiss that it lands on its flat base? How the heck do I know what that probability is, right? Well, in the classroom, you could have all the students flip Hershey Kisses and keep up with their data. And maybe as a class, I really have no idea what even a good estimate is that maybe you figure out that there's a 23% chance that it lands on its flat base, right? And you can use that to predict the probability for the next time you flip that Hershey kiss. Um, but there's no other way I would know what is the probability it lands on its base besides accumulating empirical evidence or experimental evidence, actually doing the experiment and seeing what I get, right? Of course, the law of large numbers still holds. Meaning if you're flipping my Hershey kiss 10 times, that's not real accurate, right? If you flip a Hershey kiss a thousand times, that's gonna give you a much better idea of the probability than if you only flip it 10 times. Let's make sure this was the same thing that we've talked about on test one, but I also want to show you, there's a lot of P's in statistics, unfortunately. I'm using the P here now to represent probability, 
Okay. So if you're in decimal form, probabilities run from zero to one. This is what we talked about relative frequency, right? And you know how all the relative frequencies added to one? That's going to be the same thing here. All probabilities are going to add to one. But then remember I told you you could give me the answers in percent. So yes, probabilities run from zero to 100 percent if you're doing percent form. It does not matter. When you're doing calculations, especially when we're doing our word problems and we're multiplying things, you have to be in decimal form. You cannot multiply percent forms. The percent form is really for the final answer, right? And I never care what form you give me for the final answer. You just don't want to mix and match these all in the same problem because it can get confusing. May hold off on, well, now let me just say, I'm taking a 20 minute story and I'm just going to give you the three minute highlight because here's the deal. Probability can be boring, whether it's in the classroom or listening to me on a YouTube video. Um, probability is hard, but I just wanted to throw out a couple of real life uh, stories that are interesting. So the first one, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with David Blaine. Probably he's the illusionist, magician. From the last 10 years, he's been focused on what I call feats of physical strength. But way before that, he is very known for his sleight of hand, his card tricks. And I read his autobiography. He's very good at, if he tells you to think of a card in a deck of cards, that he can usually guess what you're thinking of. Now, he explained in the book that... He has been studying human beings since he was 12. I think he's from the Bronx. And he used to just walk around the streets at 12 years old doing these card tricks, asking the same questions. And he realized that humans are fairly predictable, that we are not as unique and unpredictable as we would like to think. So he knows when he approaches someone that there's probably only about five cards that they're even gonna think of when he says, Think of a card out of a deck of cards. You know, technically there's 52 cards in there. If you're just randomly guessing, you'd only have, what, a 2% chance of guessing it correctly. But he says, from studying human behavior, that's that empirical approach, he has probably gotten it down to the top five cards for females and the top five cards for males. So he says in general he can get it right 70 to 80% of the time. No, he's not at 100%, but he's definitely over 2% just from collecting empirical evidence from his own magic trick. The next interesting story, I have the book in my office. Um, the book is called Bringing Down the House, and the movie that was based off the book is called 21. It's about playing blackjack, period. There, I start to talk to you guys like I'm Siri texting. Sorry. Anyway, this was a real story. The book is always better than the movie, right? Um, back in the 1990s, a group of geniuses, I call them geniuses, right, from MIT got together to figure out how to play Blackjack 21 really, really well. They learned all the probability theory they did things like card counting, which a lot of people don't understand, but it's a pretty basic um, thing, I'm trying to keep this story short. So then they went to Vegas and they played like a team and they made a whole lot of money. I got to hear the main guy, Jeffrey Moss, speak one time. This was before 9-11, so they had investors in Boston. They literally would fly out with, let's say, $100,000 of cash for the weekend. Sometimes they would lose $50,000 on a Friday night, but by Sunday night, they would have gained back and earned a profit of $100,000. Go back, pay off their investors, go to school a little bit, and do it again the next weekend. It was two things. It was all about law of large numbers. They knew they had to play thousands and thousands of hands of blackjack throughout the weekend to be able to make a profit. Because if you go into a casino right now and play blackjack, the odds of you winning 
or the probability of you winning, let's just say it's probably 47% or something, below 50, right? From them studying probability theory and card counting, they were able to increase that probability to, let's say, 54%, just right above the 50% mark. So it's not like, again, they were increasing it to 90% chance of them winning, just maybe 54%. So they knew that they had to play thousands and thousands of hands of blackjack to be able to realize the profit from 54% chance of them winning. Um, so again, that's the really, really, really short version of that story. It's a fascinating story. It's not as fascinating when you're just hearing me through a video staring at a whiteboard. So, but it's called bringing, just, you do not have to understand mathematics to enjoy the book. It's written for probably, you know, at a ninth grade level, bringing down the house. True story. It's about MIT playing 21 in Vegas in the 1990s. So really, really good book. All right. Told you I'd keep that short. Now, this was in your packet of notes. This is a really simple sheet. We're going to go through it now because here's the thing. As soon as we get to the word problems, you guys are going to get so confused and so lost. And you're probably not going to believe me right now, but I swear to you, it's the same fundamental concept of what I'm going to show you here. But before I even get to that, I truly am trying to head off some of the issues I know you're going to have with handout eight. So I would like to, this was not part of your notes, so you can write this down, but I would like to start with this. It's very similar to the tornado handout two that was given by design to help you with handout eight so you may want to look back at that but here's a different one i totally made up this data this was not what we collected in class that day this absolutely bears writing this down that's supposed to be a one That's a one. All probabilities add to one. What about if I ask a bunch of people, how many cats do you have? I got the frequencies and then I calculated the relative frequency. And let's say 60% had no cats, 15% had one, 10% had two, 6% had three, 4% had four, 5% had five. If you add up those numbers, you can verify they add to one, right? Out of the unit whole. Now, what about if I ask you, what's the probability a person has at least one cat? I'm going to show you the way that I'm always going to keep you organized on handout eight word problems. Okay, at least one. There's that word again, at least. We started talking about that on tornado handout two. All right, at least one is one, two, three, four, five. So I'm gonna circle what I want. What I want is what the question is asking for, right? That's what the question is asking for. Now these numbers are in front of you. You can add them up in your head probably. 25, 35, that's 40%, 0.4 right there. The problem is when you get to hand out eight, these numbers are not going to be in front of you. Okay, so it's not going to be that easy. But anyway, why do you want to have to add up five numbers in your head? Why do you want to have to add up five numbers on your calculator? So in the very next video, this little trick is going to be called the complement rule. I already showed you this trick on handout two, the tornado handout. Instead of having to add up all those five numbers, look, this entire column adds to one, right? So this guy is the only thing I didn't want. Maybe we'll put an X there. That's the only thing that the question was not. It wasn't asking for that, right? So we can go one minus what I don't want. What did I not circle? One minus the zero case. One minus 0.6 and it gives you 0.4, which we can verify. Oh yeah, that was all 0.4. 
one minus what I don't want will end up giving me what I do want. That is going to be a mantra you hear me say 50 times. Circle what you want. One minus what I don't want. What did I not circle? Zero cats. One minus a probability of 0.6 gives you 0.4. Yes, everything I wanted does equal 0.4. This is the fundamental concept to so many of the issues that you guys are going to have on handout eight. So refer back to this at some point in the future and it might help you. Checking my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting to do anything. Okay. All right. Let's look at this dice. You can just kind of add to it. There's no reason for me to put this entire thing back up on the whiteboard. It's right there in front of you, right? We don't do that much with dice. You would have done it in elementary and middle school, but just in case you forget, if we're talking about rolling two dice, let's say you're playing Monopoly, right? You roll two dice, figure out how far to move your little piece. If I just briefly asked you, how many ways can you roll two dice? A lot of students get confused. There are 36 ways, and it's particularly important that, like if you think about it, the red die, let's say you had a red die and a blue die. The red die could have faces one through six on it. The blue die could have faces one through six. So, and this was the sum. So you'll see on each little scenario, I added them up. There are, because there's six times six, 36 ways. This is covered in chapter 4.1 of your book, okay? It's not 12 ways, it's 36 ways. I'm gonna put that down just for a second. You can keep looking at it, but why don't you look at the whiteboard for a minute? What about if I asked you, how do you get a sum of seven when you're rolling two dice? If we were in the classroom, a lot of you would say three, four, five, two, six, one. And then I'd continue looking at you to get you to keep talking to me. And then some students would be like, oh yeah, it's also four, three, two, five, and one, six. But at this point, some students think I'm lying to them or that I'm you know, trying to trick them. They think I've double counted. I have not double counted. And that's where if you can view it as a red die and a blue die, find three, four right there, right? I'm even gonna circle that. Well, I'll circle it. Three, four, and four, three. Just that right there. That's four comma three and that's three comma four. Those are two different. You'd be able to tell them different, right? That would be blue, that would be red, that would be blue, that would be red. You'd be able to tell them apart. It's not that we're double counting. And that is why actually, if you look at all these sums, you can see there are six ways to get a sum of seven. Yeah, those are the six ways. So you can think about it in your head. If the question is just asking you one quick little thing, you don't always have to do this entire complete sample space, right? Just as long as you remember, you got to do both. All right. Now, the next thing here was, okay, I don't want to have to keep looking and counting up. So remember when we were making relative frequency distributions for test one? And just a few minutes ago, I said that relative frequency and probability are pretty much the same thing. So I'm going to list all the different sums that I could get, like play Monopoly, right? Um, and I'm going to list the probabilities. Remember, there were 36 total. I'm keeping fractions here as opposed to getting ugly decimals. So that way you don't have to, you know, it's more intuitive on this precise problem to see the fraction. See how I could see that there were six sums of seven? That's why I put six over 36 there. Um, look at the sum of two. There's only one way to get a sum of two. So that's why the probability for a sum of two is one over 36. If you add all this up, it does equal 36 out of 36. This thing right here, oh, I typed it at the top, so I don't have to write it. This is called a probability distribution. It lists all the possible values and the probabilities associated with each. Very similar to tornado. 
very, handout two, very similar to that quick little number of cats thing I just did with you in this video. Let's answer some questions. All right, the first question, it's on your sheet. Sum of at least 11. So there's that word at least again. Um, at least 11 is 11 or 12, right? Because at least means do include that number also. So you can go straight to here. This is just like the tornado problem. Find your sum of 11, find your sum of 12. This is 2 out of 36 plus 1 out of 36 or 3 out of 36. Or if you would like, I'm not good with my 36, 0.0833 or 8.33%. I never care what form, right? This is just reviewing that you know what the word at least means because you're going to see that word probably 20 times on handout eight. So that wasn't hard. We just added up the two different things that it asked for, right? No big deal. All right, sum of at least three. Well, that could be three or four or five, or six, I'm already bored guys, or 11, or 12. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Up to this point, you could have argued in your head with me and said, lady, I'm gonna go the long way. I'm gonna add up those four or five numbers. Oh my goodness. I'm gonna, oh, let me find my sheet I'm writing on. You want all of that? My goodness. Doing the exact technique we just did with the number of cats a few minutes ago and tornado handout two, I'm trying to show you that everything I do, there is rhyme and reason that I pick these examples, not randomly, but to support each other. This is what this problem is asking for. That is what I want. All the cases three down to 12. No, I don't feel like adding up two, four, six, eight, those 10 numbers, right? I'm just way too lazy for that, way too lazy. But look, there's only one little guy I did not circle. If all of that adds to one, then I can go one minus what I don't want. What did you not circle? The sum of two. That's the only thing that I did not want in the original question. So one minus, well, what's the probability of a sum of two? One over 36. So this is 35 over 36 or, oops, 0.9722. Remember four decimal places. So if you want, when you turn it into a percent, I don't care which form, my photo booth froze up again. All I wrote was 0.9722 or 97.22%. There is no other notes that you're missing Thank goodness we're at the end of this video. I know you can still hear me. You just can't see me. Um, and I'm going to have to figure out why my photo booth is glitching so bad on a brand new Mac. But this was the end of the video. Again, I just put that fraction into my calculator to get 0.9722. So I got lucky on when this froze. Um, the very next video you're gonna watch is gonna have all the probability rules plus a bunch of word problems. So be alert and awake when you're watching it and re-practice all those problems. But that's the nice thing about watching videos. You can pause them and go back and that type of thing. So, all right, we will talk to you soon.